Roll the drums to see who won the Nintendo Switch. And it is going to be Geodaki. Congratulations. I sent you an email on your profile that you listed there. So make sure to check that out so I can ship out your limited edition Animal Crossing Nintendo Switch as fast as possible. Congratulations and enjoy, man. And also, guys, do make sure to follow me on Twitter at Zero Wonder and on Instagram at Zero Wonder because I am constantly doing different types of giveaways. So if you do want to win some free stuff for just basically just supporting me, then feel free. With that said, enjoy today's video. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about, which is, in my opinion, probably the saddest, most heartbreaking story in all of Smash Bros. lore. Now, generally, whenever we talk about stories of the past, we talk about some type of underdog story or how someone came from pretty much nothing and made something amazing and then, you know, and then they quit on top and everyone's so happy ever after, right? But today's story, I think, is a little bit sad because it doesn't actually end on a good note. But the reason I think it's very valuable to talk about it because there's a lot of lessons to be learned along the way, which is why I wanted to take you guys along for the ride. This is a story of probably my favorite smasher of back in the day, Korean DJ and his story. KDJ went from nothing to the biggest stage Melee had ever known in less than a year. Korean DJ wasn't someone who made it happen in multiple years. He basically just came guns blazing out of nowhere and made it all happen within one year. PC Crest paved the way for Korean DJ and Mewtwo King. All three of them basically came to prominence at the same time. At the time, the best players were Ken and Isaiah and Azin. But then as time went on, Ken pretty much retired. Azin started also losing interest and Isaiah also pretty much moved back from Melee going all the way back to 64, which is where you will sometimes see him compete actually in 64 tournaments even to this day. And this is around the time when Mewtwo King came to prominence. Back before that, he wasn't actually a notable tournament player, but he was more so one of those knowledgeable forum guys where like he was making guides and making frame data and just making all sorts of technical documents for people to learn, but he wasn't actually going out there and doing the dirty to win in the tournaments. UK um, had gone to some local tournaments around. Oh my God, Jason, what are you wearing, bro? I actually show this picture to Jason back in the day. I don't know what he said. He said something on the lines of like, I thought I looked good. <laughs> the only thing I can think of when I see him wearing this is just <laughs> it's a watermelon. It's a watermelon attire. He didn't have any level of mind games really. He was just relying totally on his knowledge of, of tech skill. Korean DJ, we just didn't hear about it at all. Oh, this is the best part. Uh, Korean DJ is actually a musician. And he actually has a channel where he does a lot of covers and a lot of original music. And he's actually also done orchestras and he's done a whole bunch of stuff, really. He's actually really successful in music, which is completely separate from all his Smash Bros stuff. And if I'm not mistaken, some of the music in this episode is actually from Korean DJ. The first orchestra meeting I had was absolutely horrifying because I couldn't read sheet music. I just play by ear. And that's also how he became really good at Smash. He wasn't the kind of person that just read a bunch of guys. He was just more about the feel and just feeling out the game. For some reason, I became the uh, the concert master of the orchestra. <laughs> and I just went from this guy who just has absolutely no idea how to read sheet music to becoming the concert master in four years. I was like, I don't know how that happened. When it came down to it, Korean DJ pretty much set the standard for world record pace on how fast you can get up to the best top three players in the world because they look like a speed run from the outside perspective. My dad was like the CEO of his own like clothing store called J City. And it was really successful. We had many chains up in Boston. We're actually looking to, thinking about extending it to like New England. I remember it was second grade. Um, my dad and my mom went to a business trip down in Florida. My dad had to go pick up some shipments, some jeans from China that he had imported. One of my dad's friends gave him a referral. It's like, oh, this guy can give you a ride. The guy went to a bar and he was pretty hammered. <sighs> he dozed off on the wheel, crashed into a concrete wall. Doctors were like, no, this guy, has only like a 10% chance of living. It's actually really hard to listen to because you can you can actually hear how it really affects him just from the way he's talking. Like everywhere else in the video, he just sounds like a very confident person. And I mean, I met him in person. I've talked to him. I play with him. I even team with him at a tournament at EVO 2014 in Melee. And he's just a very down to earth, very positive kind of person. He's a little cocky, but you know, that's the fun of his personality. But when he talked about that, you can kind of just feel the pain through his words. It's it's hard for me to describe it in words maybe my english isn't so good but it's i feel like you guys can understand what i mean but um personally when growing up i can understand the pain of having your parents not be around it's not the same as him in in that regard for me i grew up with pretty much just my mom my dad wasn't really around the picture of me he, he left us and for me that kind of just created like a void for a very long time and i feel like that void is kind of what i latched on to give myself motivation because for a long time i didn't really think i could make something out of anything 
and having that boy be there motivated me to keep pushing forward. As a second grader, it's you don't really understand the magnitude of how serious things are. He just wouldn't give up. Like, he just didn't care. He just wanted to just get better. Just to see that happen, you know, it's really inspirational. Like, like to see him like going through all this stuff. My father was in the hospital in recovering. My mom had to go to work. So most of the time I was by myself. A lot of the things that I did to really pass the time was like video games. I think this is one of the many reasons why I relate to him so much because like I had so many bad things happen to me in the past that because I used video games as escape, it ended up not only becoming the main thing that I did, but it ended up giving me a job. It ended up giving me friendships and it ended up allowing me to pretty much transition from being, you know, a little kid, a teenager into an adult. And it all happened really because of video games and going through that entire, you know, phase really because of something that a lot of people deem as a waste of time. It really just makes me love video games even that much. And I think it's amazing just how we can all connect with just Smash. And this is why I think the story is so compelling because it touches on a lot of different topics that I think people can relate to or they can connect with. It's a story that's not just human, but it's just real. I used to play with the Fall River crew, it was the Ninja Turtles. It was Crazy Jones, Hayato, Roga, Eve, Unknown Force. He understood the game like decently well, but you would never have guessed he was going to be one of the best players in the world at that point. I was getting like maybe ninth place in my local tournaments. It was like decent, but I wasn't like, I wasn't satisfied. One theme that I noticed between a lot of people that end up being very successful or extremely skillful at an area or a sport or even a video game is that a lot of the time they just see the results or they see their performances and within themselves, they don't feel satisfied. They're constantly on the grind, constantly on the path to try to achieve something more. They're always trying to push themselves more. A lot of the time people think that becoming better at something is like a cheat code or there's like a secret to it. And there's not really a secret. It is just the boring, slow, methodical process of let me just do this over and over and over again and constantly try to push myself to do it faster, do it more efficiently, be stronger, be smarter. It, it sucks, but you know, that's why a lot of people look up to and respect people that are excellent at things. I wrote down a list of all the people around me Who's better than me? It was like a ladder process. I do it step by step by step by step. He had a plan. He was realistic. Like I'll beat the best player in my crew. Then I'll beat the best player in my own university. Then I'll beat the best player at my local tournaments. I'll beat the best player in my state. I'll beat the best player in my side of the country. I'll beat the best player on the other side of the country. And then eventually let's fight the best players in the entire country. It's a realistic step process that people can follow. It's kind of like following like a ladder and all the steps get to the peak of it. Essentially, you're not gonna just take on the whole challenge at once, but rather one step at a time. I went to a tournament on the East Coast randomly, but I didn't have a partner. I asked around on the boards, and one guy offered, his name was Korean DJ. I really didn't want to team with him. Like, I didn't know who he was. He wasn't doing very well. Like, he was just kind of low level. Instead, when I show up, he money matched. He asked me for a money match. I was notorious for money matching literally everybody. Now, in case you guys don't know, a money match is pretty much like a gamble. So whoever wins the match, you agreed up on amount, certain rules before the said, and then you put the money down the table in cash and then the winner takes the money it's as simple as that and it's actually a very effective method that a lot of people have used to get better matter of fact i actually used money matches myself quite a bit when i came to america people didn't really know me didn't really respect me they just saw me as some online 16 year old player from you know a third world country so i mean who cares you know about playing this guy well, what i did is that i basically saved like 300 dollars in cash that took me like a year to save because getting money back then was almost impossible and then i went to the tournament with my bag of 300 dollars and then i played pretty much every top player for a certain amount i literally got my experience with everybody in the venue i played all the japanese players all the american players i even played european players i played like a hundred good players in one weekend because i kept money matching and i think from that experience a year later i was beating players like mutik and beating players like naro because you know I, that experience helped me to get better so it was a small investment but it got me all the way up there i don't care how good you are i don't care if you can i don't care if you're pc chris i don't care if Azia. i'll money match you five bucks truth be told i, I spanked him like i <laughs> messed him up he asked me to money match i was like who is this guy <laughs> 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 I mean, it is like that, but I mean, if you went back in the day, keep in mind, top players were winning the whole tournament for like $800. If you offer them five, 10 bucks for them to beat you two games, they're definitely going to do it. For example, here's me fighting Ally for $50 at Apex 2012, which was my first international major in the United States. 
and I knew for a fact I was not gonna be able to beat him. I got absolutely massacred 4 0 by him. He pretty much humiliated me, and it didn't really look like I knew what I was doing. Now, what's the fun fact is that Ally actually never beat me in Brawl in tournament. I actually beat him every single time we played in tournament, and this is actually the only time he ever beat me, which was the money match. So, I mean, who really won by losing those 50 bucks, huh? But you have to factor in the money. He was paying maybe five dollars or whatever it was to get matches with the best players and they were going to be taking it more seriously than they would in friendlies where they almost never play seriously. Exactly. Almost always sandbag. It's an investment. And he goes, okay, we'll rematch again. It's like, all right, sure. Like, he wants to give me more money, that's fine with me. It was like being a sponge. Like you would just come in, play all these people, spend maybe 50, 100 bucks on the weekend, but then you were a sponge. You were absorbing everything. That's why I relate to him so much because I feel like we did the same thing. We came from like a tragic environment and then like things were, were sucking and then we just went to these events and we were just like a sponge absorbing everything around us and then Learning. I don't know. That's why I love it, man. I'm sorry, it's to get better. You already know what's going on. Oh, we have the music montage. You already know he whooping ass. He just started improving exponentially every time he would play. And it was down to the wire. It was down to the last hit. And I was just thinking, this kid is hitting good. You love to hear it, man. You love to see it. I wouldn't be surprised if he beat me in tournament at that point. I think after that point, Hugs actually never beat him in tournament ever after. <laughs> There's just a level of epic when your own montage music is played by yourself. It just feels awesome to prove people wrong, and I can relate that to so much. I kind of turned from feeling sorry for him to kind of having a lot of respect for him, because he was willing to get his ass beat. Ever since then, I wasn't even close. At every tournament, he had the plan of, in the end, becoming the best. My man is like a hitman. I felt like me and KDJ instantly got along. I mean, like, I feel like I have a lot of rivals, but me and Korean DJ are another rivalry because, like, New York versus Boston, we got that going on. I hung out with him the most out of any of the other professional players and definitely had a great time hanging out with him. He's a good guy. The rivalry is actually extremely relevant and very important to the story. In a lot of ways, they both come around from the same environment. Like, Korean DJ was trying to be the best player and PC Chris did not think he could be the best player, but eventually he found himself in a position where he could be. And alas, that sets up their encounter. They had five normal tournaments like regional tournaments like one in New York, one in Texas, one in Chicago, one in Florida, and then one in Cali. And then they had a playoff in New York and then a final in Las Vegas. And that was like the 2006 lineup. All the regional ones were $2,000 for first place. For New York playoffs, first and that's place by the way millions dollars for the finals. For Smash Vegas, players, those are millions. You know how I wrote down that list of people to beat. Ken was at the top. The best player, man. Saw Korean DJ. I would just hear someone say, money match, money match, money match, money match. <laughs> he was the, like, final, final, like, goal and achievement. For me, that player was Mijikin. For me, if I could ever beat Mijikin in tournament, I knew I made it because th that's the guy. I mean, he was the best player in Brawl, the best player in Melee. Being the best at both games at once back in the day, it was incredible. You didn't even have top 10 players in either game cross over to the other game because it was just so never seen before. And for me to beat the Smash Bros guy, that was my ultimate goal. And when I beat him, I believe it was in 2012, at the end of 2012 or 2013, I remember I popped off so hard, man. I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, you can do this. Oh, don't get punished. That's right. Ooh, that down smash, by the way, is frame perfect or very close to it. You have to like barely walk right as he releases and down smash and react. It's actually much harder than it looks. Oh, no! <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, no! <laughs> that pop up is so cringe. I'm never popping up like that on anyone. But I knew I was so hype and because I have so much respect for him, my pop up. Uh, was that big. That's why I relate to Korean DJ so much. I mean, he was hyper. I was hyper too when I was coming up in the scene. He must have chugged like six Red Bulls or something before he went to a tournament because the guy was like hyper. MLG Orlando, winner semis. I have never played as well as I did in MLG Orlando against Ken. Now you might be wondering why we have pictures. Well, you see. I was starting to do things with Sheik that I never thought was possible. DVD popped open, said it was full. Oh. In the middle of a match against Ken. So I wasn't able to keep it. Oh my god. Yeah, back then, they didn't even really use capture cards. Capture cards were not really a thing. It's like, nowadays, you can just plug in one thing into the to the Switch or maybe have like a small laptop and then you can record the whole game or you can just save replays because the system allows you to. Melee and the GameCube had none of those luxuries. I mean, if you didn't have a DVD or someone purposely saving it, 99% of matches were just lost in time. There's certain things that I was doing with Sheik that I never did again. 
and I wanted to see what was I doing. <laughs> he was just very, very aggressive and very hyper. It comes to a point where you have to be really defensive against that or be more hyper and aggressive. And I was right in the middle of that. So I guess his style pretty much countered my style. I call this, you're so aggressive that you make an aggressive player end up being defensive. The cool thing about Ken is that he was actually a pretty aggressive player despite playing a character that's most commonly played in a more defensive than Marth is a spacing character. But even then, Ken actually chose to play more aggressively and pretty much forced his opponents to make a bunch of mistakes because he was so up in their face. But because Korean DJ was so aggressive, he was able to pretty much make Ken uncomfortable in his own play style. A lot of players actually crumble to that. I could read him. I mean, he was an open book, but it doesn't mean anything. You can read a book if every single time you turn the page, you get a paper cut or something like that, you know? Like the entire crowd just went uproaring. They were going crazy. <laughs> he was popping up. And I just felt like I just won the tournament. And then I played against Azin's Marth. I beat Ken's Marth. I got this. I lost. Oh my God, dude. Some of those feelings so overconfident from a win can really get to you. It can really just... Push, just take the win out of you because you're just like wow man i just beat the best player i should win the tournament but alas winning a tournament is not just about being the best player yes he's probably the hardest player that you can beat in terms of skill but then again you also have to make it to the finals and win the last match which is why sometimes you'll see these big upsets at tournaments where like you know leo goes to lose this or something crazy like that happens and then people are like oh that guy's gonna win the tournament and he doesn't he kind of crumbles after that because it's hard you know after you take so much mental energy to beat that one person and keep going at the end of the day tournaments are not races they're marathons. You have to be able to maintain that energy throughout the whole thing, which is why players like Leo are so good because they can keep playing excellent through all the rounds, even if they have to make a huge run through losers bracket. I beat Kensmarth. I lost to Azen. Within the pros, I mean, certain people did better against other people. There's definitely a lot of that even today. For example, take a look at ultimate gameplay and then you'll see certain people do much better against Leo than they do against other top players. Or maybe Leo will struggle against very specific players or maybe specific characters. It all comes down to play styles, essentially. It is actually a big deal when it comes down to counter picks. And actually, when I competed, there were certain players that I would prefer to, you know, not play in tournament. For example, I would rather have played Leo and Naro than, for example, have played like the best Pac-Man player or, or, for example, the best Luigi players. Because I knew for a fact, you know, I struggle against those kind of play styles. And I knew Diddy Kong would kind of struggle against those characters as well. So I was more worried for those guys than playing maybe Leo and Naro. That's kind of how matchups end up being. Towards the end of the MLG season, I didn't even place very well. So it was all kind of shaken up in my head. I didn't know what was going on. I started off first, got third at Dallas, second at Anaheim, fifth at Chicago, which was my lowest placing at the time. And then at Orlando, I finished 13th, which was the last one before New York. At the time, people were thinking that PC Chris could be the best player in the world. You overtook Ken that one tournament, but then Ken kind of came back and started roaring back and winning. Aston was kind of on the comeback as well. Mewtiki was on the rise. Korean DJ was on the rise. You had like the old, very good players like Ken and Azen, and then you had the new guys, Korean DJ, PC Chris, and Mewtiki that were all clashing down at the MLG finale, which is the big storyline of this video is that all this is happening while these guys are gearing up throughout the circuit to fight it off and Las Vegas for that five digit paycheck, the biggest paycheck at the time in Smash. K DJ beats M2K. So that sets up Ken versus M2K, first round of losers and Ken loses. At the time, Mutikin was really up on the rise. And I think that was what, either the first time that Mutikin beat Ken or maybe the second time. But at the time, Ken was really starting to fall off because like he was losing motivation with the game, but he was also losing to people a lot more. Keep in mind, Ken was from an era where he just did not lose. He was called the King of Smash for a reason. I mean, I will open magazines in gaming at the time and I will see people talking about Ken. Like people were maybe playing all these newer games on newer consoles, but people were talking about Ken because it was actually a defining moment of an era where there was a champion who was so excellent that he wasn't losing. He was winning years of MLG tournaments. Ken was on survival. He was on TV because of gaming, because he was so excellent at Melee, and it paved the way for so many esports athletes to kind of just follow in the route that, you know, he said. He was a ton of inspiration for a lot of people and actually one of my biggest pieces of inspiration. But I feel like I also relate to him a lot because he ended up losing a lot of motivation with competition in general. It wasn't fun anymore. Pretty much like it became like a job more, more so. It always than, becomes a job. You know, actually playing the game and having fun. I was getting older. I was traveling way too much. Uh, I don't think my body could take it as much. After two, three years of doing it, it just it just takes a toll on you. Back in the day when I used to practice a lot for Smash tournaments and I was like at the peak of my skill level, I could play for like 10, 12 hours and I didn't really care about anything. I could go on without eating, without sleeping. And nowadays, if I play like three hours of Smash, I need a break for a nap. I need a break for like a snack. I need to drink water before and after enduring. Like, I feel like my body just falls apart, man. <laughs> 
<laughs> the worst part is I'm also doing more exercise and more movement than I ever did in my whole life. Um, it's just, I feel like the toll, the mental toll that I take from the game is so much higher than it was before. All that stress is just like compiled in and having like chilling dude or whatever yelling in my ear next to me. I can't handle it anymore. The Smash Bros uh, schedule for travel was absolutely ridiculous. You're literally traveling across the country two or three times a month. I mean, players know it is for Ultimate. They're traveling out of, you know, out of their home state two to three times a week. They're also streaming during the week. They're making YouTube content. It's just the, the schedule for the average professional now is ridiculous compared to before. And the amount of people that do the job for a couple of years and then quit and definitely is insane because people just get so burned out, which is why for me, it was very important for me to quit Smash competitively when I did because I didn't want to hate the game. That's what it came down to. I didn't want to hate something that brought me so much joy. I was starting to see it in a way that it was only negative. And I didn't like that because for me, it means so much and it still does. And I, you know, I think about Smash every day. I mean, Smash is never not going to be a part of my life, but I don't want to get to the point where I hate something that I love. And I love the position that I'm in so much because I can talk about the game. I can play it. I can have fun with it. I've had the most fun playing Smash, making videos for you guys than I ever did in my life before. And that for me is a massive win. And that's what it, it is all about. Oh, Las, Las Vegas, Vegas, baby. So we have here the epitome of MLG. We were at the Red Rock Casino. Ooh, I'm telling you guys, there is no greater feeling than going to Las Vegas for the biggest tournaments. It's the same feeling that I get when I go to EVO when I was a competitor. It was like this excitement, this hype. We're going to the world finals, to the big boy finals. We're going to be in front of all the cameras, all the exposure, the big money. I mean, obviously not the big money, but just that feeling of being in the casino with all this luxury and just everything going on. Because Las Vegas is insane. Going to the strip to play in video games like that is absolutely insane. And for me, that feeling is something that I'll never forget. And this is why for me, winning my first EVO and then doing so excellent and all the others remains top here in terms of experiences for me because it's like man that's like we got here playing games and it's crazy and i don't know just thinking about it makes me all giggly I was thinking at the time like this is i think this is probably gonna be my last tournament my fire is about to burn out he's gonna make a count I try i i definitely know i can i could compete and beat these guys my whole life was to win the mlg last championships because that pretty much means you won everything winning the finals is really what it comes down to it you could win the first couple ones but Whoever really wins the finals is the one that people are going to talk about. It is the biggest one. It is the most important one. It is where all the eggs are placed. So you got to win that one. So that is the ultimate goal. And Korean DJ wanted to be the best player in the world. So he must win the finals. And this is where the storyline really hits because Korean DJ had a tragic story. He had a very difficult upbringing. And then coming into the finals here, how he got good so quick, how he pretty much blasted through the scene. And now he's at the finals with a real chance of winning the whole thing because he's winning events now. He's in the position to become the best player. And this is where he can prove it. And Korean DJ beating Ken at the finals was the biggest thing because obviously that's the best player. But then him beating Ken at his final real serious tournament after that, he maybe competed in like one or two tournaments after that. But then he pretty much quit for like a decade after that. So we didn't really see him. And then he came back for like a year or two and then quit again. So that was like really like the last of Ken at his peak. And Korean DJ was one of the last people to like take him out of tournament, right? And then it sets up this storyline where you had like the two new people coming in at the finals. You had no Ken, no Isaiah, no As, and none of the old school people. You had the new guys duking it out in the finals to become the best player. And I think that's really where the story really peaks at right here. Look at the stage right here. Man, Man. Like, right, this is my tournament. This is my dream. <sighs> Oh. I'm telling you, there is nothing more impactful than when all the dreams are packed because competitors, they, they duke it out. They put all their dreams in, in the basket. They compete and go out there and they try to make, you know, their dreams happen. They go and chase it out. And then, you know, the other defeat, the, the incredible amount of pressure that you feel putting all of it into it. And then if it works out, it's ah, incredible pop off. And if it doesn't work, then it's like, you know, crippling sadness. And I don't know, that intensity is something that even to this day, I still feel, and it's it's otherworldly. This is why I always tell people, like, at least have one point in your life where you competed in something, just so you can feel that, because it makes you feel alive. Ooh! Man, the, the music is just, it's just really setting it up. PC has won. Congratulations to PC Chris. He came in at the beginning of the season, stunned everyone by beating Ken. He outlasts everyone else. He's going to take home $10,000, Envy Crown, 
the national champion of Super Smash Brothers. Man, that's the check. That's the win, man. And this is why I say this story is heartbreaking and it's sad because Korean DJ put everything in the line. He had all those dreams. He went from nothing at the beginning of the year and then went all the way to the finals, beating the best players in the world. And it, he came down to the very last game of the very last set against his rival from the beginning, PC Chris. They both, you know, were playing the same tournaments when they started. And, you know, he wasn't able to win. And I think that's why the story really rings so many bells with me because it's the story of how you came from nothing. You went all the way here at the top. And then when it came down to taking that one final step, that one final stock and all you really needed was just to take that one more stock and it comes crashing down it, it burns and crashes and then suddenly your dream is dead and and i think that's why the story is so heartbreaking because for a long time you'll think man what could have been what could we have done differently it was almost like a body high like i just felt great the entire day i never wanted to be the best player that was never my goal but just like putting my time into something and seeing like these great results and you know, like i couldn't believe like from this game that I picked up with my friends that I able to accomplish something like this. I was set on third. I was like, I'm happy, I'll take third. When he got third and when he didn't become the best player anymore, he's like, you know what, that's okay. I can I can retire pretty happy because I know that I've done a lot in my time and I was during a pretty, uh, I guess, a you know, golden era of Smash. So even to this day, he'd still be called the king of Smash. That's kind of exactly how I feel. It was like, just, I can retire happy. I feel like I did a lot. And that's why I like him because I can relate to his story so much. And for me, relating with people and their experiences for me is the best way to connect with anyone. I felt like a, a huge weight was left off my shoulders. A deep breath. Like, <sighs> I can just, just be happy. Mm. There's about a one minute segment where Korean DJ talks about the disappointment from losing the finals. I'm going to put the quotes here and then we can kind of just look at the quotes and then I can give you guys some commentary on that. But I can't really show you the segment because it has a copyright of music and the whole video cannot even be monetized in any capacity. If obviously we have that type of music on, so I can't really show it to you. But I really recommend you to watch the original. It's around the 30 minute, 20 second mark. It's about a minute long. It's on the episode number six of the Smash Bros documentary. Just watch that one minute, if anything, because it will really hit you like a ton of bricks. And I can't really give you that same feeling by just kind of just doing it this way without his voice, but I'll do my best. I was just one game away from being the champion. I couldn't go to sleep for about four days. I felt that way after losing an event where like, it just feels like the world crumbles down and then there's just, there's nothing you can do. I mean, it, it, it hits you so hard. It's just, it's a level of sadness that I can't describe. And the, the way he talks about it is like, for, for some reason, for some reason, I couldn't take that one last talk on him. You know, and then when you needed not to make mistakes, when, when things were, you couldn't flush and when you could not flub those plays that or those combos, then everything just pow. But here's the most heartbreaking part of it all. Korean DJ says, so then I'm going to have to wait another year to have another chance at the MLG Pro Circuit Finals. And guess what? In 2006, the MLG Circuit dropped Melee because of Nintendo not supporting them with rights to put it on TV to support it further. They had to drop it because of Nintendo. It wasn't because of the circuit not being successful. It was actually one of their most successful circuits. It was actually right up there with Halo and they had so many plans to keep doing Smash Bros stuff, but because Nintendo got in the way, then they had to drop it. The way the story ends is actually really sad because Korean DJ never really got the chance to ever chase that MLG circuit national title. He never really happened again for Melee. In the next two years, he ended up retiring and doing other things. He ended up coming back briefly for 2014. I ended up teaming with him at a tournament at, at EVO. Uh, we teamed for the doubles competition at Melee. We placed fourth, I believe. That was the time of my life because I got the chance to play with one of my idols and one of my favorite, you know, legends of Smash in general. You never really had the opportunity to see Korean DJ come back into the spotlight and, you know, get his dream. And I think that's the most heartbreaking part of it all because he had a dream that he was one step away from getting, but he wasn't able to. Now, keep in mind, I understand that this may sound like we're finishing the video in a sad note, and I don't like to do that. It's actually not a sad note. What I want you guys to understand is that even though Korean DJ was one step away from accomplishing his goal, every time you see him talk about his Smash Bros. career, every time you see him talk about Smash in general, he always has positive things to talk about. He always talks about it in a positive experience. The biggest lesson to be learned is that even when sometimes you put all of yourself to accomplish a goal and it doesn't work out, at the very least, you can say you try. And I think there's nothing worse than having dreams, having passions that you never chase and you let them sit there and you never actually attempted to try them. I think that is the worst type of failure anyone can do because you didn't even give yourself the chance to at least fail, to at least even see if you can make it happen. At least if you tried all of it and you failed, it's fine. You try your best and that's perfectly fine. But you know, if you never really even tried to give it a chance, then 
you know, then who says that you cannot make it right? Anyway, I hope this video was inspiring to you guys in some capacity. I definitely got the feels and the chills during this video, but I hope you guys also enjoy this as much as I did making this. With that said, guys, be sure to subscribe, hit the bell and stay tuned with more videos. We are doing amazing in the channel and I really appreciate you guys for all the support. As always, see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thanks for watching.